Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Daniel Cap. Welcome to um, our biweekly, usually, uh, virtual plant clinic. Uh, for those of you who have been with us before, I'm not Sally. Sally is once again out sick with us, and we hope that she does get better. Um, so today we have David Yost doing our virtual plant clinic um, on evergreens for screening. Uh, a couple house cleaning things, uh, housekeeping uh, things for people who have not been on before, but this is a Zoom webinar, not a Zoom meeting. So uh, even though you can see us and hear us, we can't see or hear you, um, but you are able to uh, ask questions via the Q&A tab that should be at the bottom of your screen. Um, and if there's uh, any problems with anything, you can also uh, use the chat function that's also down on the bottom of your screen. I can see both of those. Um, David has a, uh, a packed virtual plant clinic today uh, with some slides. And then, uh, so because of that, we're going to wait till the very end to do um, questions, but there will be time for questions at the end. Um, if for some reason your question doesn't get answered by the time we're done, uh, we're going to be uh, on till about 2.45 today, um, then feel free to uh, email David or myself or myself through our um contact us page uh, on our website, maryfieldgardencenter.com. Uh, I think that's about it. So um, if there's, uh, without any further ado, I'm going to uh, send it over to David. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for joining us today on the virtual plant clinic. Uh, as Daniel already told you, we are going to talk about evergreens for screening of so one of the basic tenets that we follow with landscape design a lot of times is trying to use plants to define different spaces in our garden. Of course, we could do this in other ways. You can put fencing up, you can change the terrain, uh, all sorts of things. But a lot of times if we're trying to create rooms within the landscape, you might be creating an outdoor living area where you want to sit and barbecue, or you might have a workspace that you want to sort of contain or isolate, or sometimes you're trying to just um, enclose an area to provide you privacy. And so for creating these environments, so what I say sort of building the wall or creating the screen around that, we often rely on evergreens. Uh, again, that doesn't mean that you have to use evergreens, you can use all different forms, but because evergreens are there year round uh, and give us that kind of enclosure or obstructive view or provide that privacy year round, that's where the focus is. So I'm gonna go through a few different ideas on I think how we should use plants to create this, uh, different thoughts on you know, some of the plants that we could use. And as Daniel mentioned, we really like to make this interactive as possible. So please, please send um, questions, comments, uh, your experiences, things that worked well for you. We all learn from each other here. And so we'll follow up on that just a little bit. Because I have more pictures and images than usual, I said, well, let me just kind of hit that. We'll go through it pretty quickly as best as I can. And then we'll hold off on all these kind of questions, comments till the end. So I'm kind of looking at my little notes. And I think with that, I'm ready pretty much to get started. So here we go. So I put this in uh, my picture is kind of in a sequence, a little bit following my own sort of personal story or personal history. And what happens if you've been gardening for 40, 50 years, you start to see where trends happen. Trends come and go. If you stick around one place long enough, you see this happen. So I kind of thought, hey, it'd be sort of fun to talk about the way I have seen uh, use of evergreens trend and screening this there. Uh, so with that, I really like to begin with what's called white cedar or sometimes American cedar, the Thuya occidentalis. Uh, I put this in here because one is it's a really wonderful tree. I mean, these guys, they're, they're, they're so stately and if they get really old, they get some nice bark characteristics. They open up, um, develop a little more character in their branching. Um, and it's just a really just wonderful welcome trees. But I think what happened is a lot during the 50s, 60s, into the 70s, this was like the go-to plant that people used a lot for this kind of screening effect, or a lot of times they were planted on the corner of a house or 
to soften the corners and that type of thing. But these get to be big trees. This is a image I just pulled off the um, internet over here. It shows mature white cedar. And you can see how tall it gets. You know, these things uh, 40, 50 feet tall, even on really old mature specimens. And they can get quite broad, more than you see in this image. So what happened a lot of times is just the scale of the tree tends to outgrow the scale of the house. So while they used a lot in residential landscaping, it really never was a suitable tree. It was just kind of working with what we had. They also, even though they are evergreen, and I absolutely love the tree, they tend to brown out a little bit, go kind of bronzy colored in the wintertime. So when you see it in its native naturalized state, I have all these great things to say about, but again, as a landscape tree, you got to be pretty um, thoughtful or careful where you uh, place it. I put my little distribution map up here because what happens is where you see these um, the green areas, that is where this tree would naturally grow. And where you see it doing its absolute best is in cooler climates. So as you go up in here into Michigan, Minnesota, New York, into the Northeast, and the more mountainous areas uh, throughout Virginia, that's where the plant really thrives, but it is considered a, a Virginia native plant. But I said, normally you would find it at a little bit cooler, more higher elevations. But what happens is like we do this all the time with trees. We get a tree that's wonderful, it's magnificent, but we realize the limitations it has is maybe it's just too big for residential properties. So there, will be a, a mutation that develops oftentimes on tree and says, hey, well, this is the same tree, but this one is small, it's compact, it's dense, it retains its winter color better. And so then this is where the emerald green arbor variety becomes introduced. And when you come into the garden center or nursery today, this is most likely what you're going to find. So emerald green arbor variety, which is has all the wonderful uh, characteristics of the parent plant, but it will usually peak out matured about 15 feet tall, uh, maybe three, four feet wide. So it really fits much better into sort of smaller landscapes. And it has this density in here that makes it really effective if we're trying to screen out a view or create this sense of enclosure that's in there. So I love the emerald green arborvitae. Um, I can't even say this name, uh, smart. You, I'll let you try that. This is what happens when you get a plant breeder. And I think they were, I'm trying to remember if they were in Sweden or something, names the plant. And then it takes a marketing person to get hold and give it a catchy name like this to make it sell. But this is where all the confusion is. We have all these different names for the same plant. Um, it's a wonderful plant, but every plant in the landscape can have some issues with it. Bagworm is the most common one. This is a moth and the eggs, what will happen is um, if you find any of these in your arborvitae right now, that one of two things happens. If it happened to be a male that was sitting in the cocoon, this male emerges out of this, flies over, mates impregnates the female, and then she lays eggs and those eggs persist in this cocoon like covering. So if you have any of these, it's really best to remove them now and destroy them. And that can prevent any of those eggs from persisting through the winter because when they hatch out, they will do this type of devastation or damage to the tree. Um, but otherwise, this is really a pretty easy plant to grow. Uh, one of the other things that you have to be aware of is that this is a tree that the deer will browse on. And you can see what's happened right here. Um, this is right about the browse line. This is about the point where deer will chew a gnaw on it right about to that point. So this situation is somebody obviously has deer. They're backed up in the wooded area. Uh, they made appropriate choice as far as the height, the shape, the size of the plant, but didn't take any precautions against deer. So if you're in this circumstances, you either are going to have to take ownership of putting some type of deer protection, uh, putting uh, repellents in there, or maybe you rethink some of your plant choices that are in there. But one of the things that this really is trying to, to brings up, or I will be emphasizing several times throughout this program, 
is I really think that we have to focus on a diverse collection of plants in our landscape. You never, ever, never really want to just land on one plant choice and rely on that to do everything for you. Otherwise, you end up in a situation like this where I don't, I can't remember, this might be 40 different arborvitae, um, and now you're having trouble with each one of them. So arborvitae, like I said, that was a, a super popular plant. It still is a super popular plant with some of the smaller, more compact varieties. Um, and I feel very comfortable recommending it in a lot of situations. But as we sort of moved along and we kind of start getting more into the 80s, of even late 70s, but really in the 1980s, uh, Leyland cypress became the wonder plant. Uh, Leyland cypress became so popular in large part because it was very rapid growth rate. Uh, you could plant a cypress and it would grow easily three feet a year when it's in its prime. And it's very dense, it's very full, and because of its robust growth and the fullness and urbanizing areas and wanting to create privacy between neighbors, this just became the go-to plant. And so we started seeing people planting Leyland cypress every place. Uh, and again, this, this is kind of a picture, it shows what the kind of density they have. And, and it makes sense to me that we planted them everywhere because they grew in fast. They provided this dense screening, very uh, sturdy plant, you know, basically pest resistant. It, it checked a lot of those boxes for us, but I think as it happens, and we go through this all the time, I think we went overboard planting them, you know, sort of ad nauseum throughout all different types of landscapes. And what started happening after planting literally millions of them, a disease that they get called ceridium canker. This is nothing new. This is a, a disease that has affected cypresses long as I know, but we had just a limited number of cypress in our landscape. Once we really kind of overdid it with uh, cypress in our landscape, this disease becomes widespread. And so if you've planted a long hedge of them, it gets infected. One plant moves to the next, moves to the next. That was becoming an issue. The other thing that happened was we started getting these heavy snows and the structure on Leyland cypress the year we had snow again, and I can't remember which year it was, not that long ago, uh, where we had like two back-to-back -back really heavy snows. Their structure is such that snow and ice tends to collect on this plant. It weighs them down. And then oftentimes in wet soil conditions, Leyland cypress literally just started toppling out of the ground because they couldn't support the weight of the snow and the shallow rooting and the dense clay. Uh, the ceridium canker is on there the tree started getting a bit of a bad reputation. I don't consider that I, a bad tree. I'm just not like that. I think it's a wonderful tree. It serves a lot of really good, useful purposes and still has value in our landscape. Again, it was our mistake in terms of overutilizing it, utilizing it as just the go-to tree and not providing any kind of resiliency in our landscape by not having the diversity that's in there. So that kind of ran its course. And again, they're still in sale today. They're still used today. They're still valuable part of our landscape today. But I'm going to say probably as we move into the 2000s, definitely the green giant arborvitae becomes the numerical plant for screening. Um, and that is right up and through today. This is the primary uh, screening plant that we go to. And again, all with good reason. This is a very fast growing tree so it gave us the the growth rate that you might see from a Leyland cypress it has a delicate soft texture in it dark you know nice blue green color like you might find in an arborvitae uh, it's a hybrid between uh, both a, a west coast arborvitae from western united states and then an asian uh, variety they were hybridized together and so this gives us like the best of both worlds right at the nice soft texture of the of the arborvitae they have proven themselves to be relatively deer resistant. I rarely do I even encounter bagworms on, so it sort of overcame some of the pest problems. It's very upright in its growth habit, uh, so it doesn't take up quite as much space horizontally and it grows vertically. So this becomes sort of the, the dream tree and we plant more and more and more of them. 
one things, and I, I get concerned about this again, is if we are overutilizing the plant, we now even have a couple other varieties to offer because these can grow to be 30, 40 feet tall. Maybe we don't need that much height that there's also what now is called junior giant. Looks the same, but it should stop at about 20 feet. And now there's one that's called leprechaun, which is a much smaller, more compact variety that will stay down under 15 feet. So we're getting more choices out there in sizes, and it is absolutely a wonderful plant and fulfills a lot of the needs. This was an interesting picture. I don't think this was intentional. I think it's just for whatever reason, I don't know the story, how it happened. But over here, this is the green giant arborvitae. This is the Leyland cypress. I thought it was good for you to be able to see them side by side, the differences in their growth habit. And when you look at this Leyland cypress, you sort of see how those branches are a bit more erect, how the snow tends to collect on them and they can topple over. Whereas our green giant arborvitae, the snow doesn't really seem to collect on that. That tends to shed off of there. So it really does meet a lot of different needs in our landscape. Uh, so the cherry laurel, this is an evergreen shrub, much more multi-stem that you can see in this shrub-like uh, appearance. It also maintains a very dense cover of evergreen foliage. It will grow in full sun. It will grow in pretty decent amount of shade. As it moves into the shade, it does start to lose its density. It's not quite in thick and as dense as what you see in here. You can easily shear it. Rapid growth rate. It's not unusual for the skip laurel to get 8, 10, even 12 feet tall, but it's also one that you can easily manage down at a six or eight foot height just with shearing it about once of a year. So again, cherry laurel, just the species, the Prunus laurisensis, it may grow 20 feet tall, but the skip laurel was a variety that was introduced to maintain a stouter, lower height that's in there. Since that time, there are several other varieties that will stay even smaller. One is called Otto Lucan, uh, that peaks out more like four or five foot tall. So there's a lot of different choices in here because it's such a functional plant for us where we're trying to create this kind of screening, this sense of enclosure. Generally considered deer resistant, though not, I can never say anything is you know, um, deer proof. So that's why I use this word deer resistant. But the rapid growth rate, its adaptability, different lighting conditions, the ability to, to maintain uh, the density with pruning, the beautiful green foliage in it gets an attractive white flower in spring. Again, it serves so many purposes for us that next thing you know, we start seeing on every shopping mall, every campus, every office park, every home. It became so widely planted that it, in my opinion, has now become almost, I hate to use this word, but a little bit of a problem plant for us at the clinic because they get this disease, this cherry shot hole disease. This does not kill plants. It's purely a cosmetic aesthetic problem. But when you're planting it and you're selecting it because you like the lustrous dark green foliage and that foliage gets riddled with spots and holes, it's a bit of a disappointment. Again, there are control measures for this, but who really wants to bother? Peach tree borer. This also goes after plants in the genus Prunus. So I'm talking about things like plums, peaches, cherries, and cherry laurel. It's a moth. She pretends to look like a wasp, but it's really it's a moth can't harm you. But she will lay her egg into the stem of the tree, start to chew their way into it as a caterpillar. And again, this can be really detrimental to trees. This is one that can actually lead to killing it. There are control measures here. I'm not going into that in any detail. Uh, we can always help you with that at the clinic. Again, you have to think about if I put enough of these together, if I'm planting these big extensive hedges and you'll see office buildings that have 100, 200, 300, 400 of them planted in a row. Well, if I'm a mama peach tree borer and I want a nice place to raise my young, that hedge of 400 host plants sure looks enticing. And then sometimes we see a lot of this one now. This is actually a scale insect. Most people think they have some kind of disease on their laurels. They'll bring it into the clinic saying, what disease is this? But this gross little image here, that's the actual insect. Um, she has covered herself under this uh, white cover. 
And then these are all little eggs that are developing under there. So that's actually an insect that puts her, they stick their mouth in that vascular tissue and suck the sap out, generally leading to decline in the plant. Um, again, there are treatments for that that we can always help you with at the clinic, but these are pest problems that are out there. And again, I'm not putting the plant down. It's a very good, functional, beautiful, useful plant, but we just need to make sure that we don't rely on any one plant in our landscape. I've talked about Nellie Stevens hollies. Probably might, it might very well be close to my favorite holly that's out there. It's a hybrid between Chinese and American. Again, where we're getting some of the best of both worlds. Where it's really vigorous, durable, fast growth rate, density. I have nothing but good things to say about Nellie Stevens holly. But this is just not a good practice when we plant an endless row of them, because if they do get scale or we do encounter really dry, windy conditions, you know, if we get a problem, it's going to affect all of these plants. It's not going to affect just part of it. So in my opinion, we just I'd love to see us get away from this type of screening concept. So I was doing a little homework, trying to figure out, so if I keep talking diversify, 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 what does that really mean? Uh, nobody has an exact answer on that. This 10, 20, 30 rule, I can't remember exactly. I think it might have been a Society of Landscape Architecture that put this forward. It, to me, it's a really good starting point. Uh, so we're saying if I'm going to diversify, ideally, I'd have really no more than 10% of any one particular species, you know, you see 20% of one genera, no more than 30% from any one family. So this is an example, I might say, of screening where you see this is the emerald green arborvitae, uh, providing a very beautiful screening, serving its role right there. This being a Nellie Stevens holly that's in there. And you can't see it, but down front here is I think a little bit of Japanese yew. So we've got a combination of three different um, evergreens coming from three different plant families and diversifying their landscape. So it's not just a matter of functionality, but it's a lot more attractive also. So that's going to be a big thing of what I'm saying throughout the whole uh, afternoon here. It's hard to find good examples of this. Um, fortunately, this is just about two doors down from where I live, a, a townhouse community here creating this type of screening, this boundary between themselves and the highway. I thought that we had, done, not we, this is not a Maryfield job. I don't know who did it. I just, just thought this was a good example of it. Where they've done is they've mixed, again, diversity of plants. This is the, this is the uh, green giant arborvitae. You can see that narrow upright growth. Nellie Stevens holly that's around here. One of the things that I love is that they have spaced these in appropriate distance between the plants. They've allowed spacing so there is room for these to grow. They've, they've planned these. So it will take maybe 10 years to get full, dense, 100% coverage from that street. But it will happen. And we just have to allow these plants a little time to grow. This picture is about two years ago. I want to get you an updated image because it's filled in quite a bit since that time. But I just need some nice weather to go out and get one. When you see this white pine, that's actually across the street. Because again, white pine, they just get huge. They're again, beautiful trees. It looks gorgeous here, but that's a tree that can easily go 50, 60, even more feet tall and very wide. It just needs room to grow. It doesn't show, it doesn't do justice in this image, but all these trees are pulled back from under the utility lines also. So whoever I did this, I just kind of want to reach out and say kudos for giving us a good example of a diverse screening of evergreens. We've mixed a few deciduous plants. These are crepe myrtles in here. Again, the um, this is uh, the viburnum ritidophyllum. The, uh, what am I trying to say? The, the leather leaf viburnum. Uh, this gets to be a large evergreen shrub. Uh, so they've, they've got the mix in here. You can't see it, but further down, they've got some spruce trees. So that's really my message here is let's, let's think about what the function of the plant is. We want to choose an appropriate plant for the site that we're in provide spacing for them to grow and develop. And then I've got a handful of plants here we'll talk about specifically you might want to include. So again, we can create these diverse planting stores. So the American holly, 
Uh, again, wonderful native plant. My little distribution map up here shows American hollies, pretty much native indigenous to every county within Virginia. They would normally look like this as a natural form, just a, a natural holly. They will grow in an understory of taller trees where they, as long as they're getting some bright light, you know, part sun on them, but they do tend to get a little thinner, a little sparser, and they tend also to be slow growing. Uh, so it does take some patience. If we get a little more sunlight on them, they get thicker, they get denser, their growth rate will improve a little bit. This I thought was a nice example. Again, when we say Seder Hill, it is a cultivar. It's a selection of that American holly, which just gives us a little better density, a little more thickness, a little more fullness in it. So it's the same species of plant, but it is one that has better density and probably therefore might be more suitable for landscape use. Uh, another Virginia native I want to put in there because it gets so readily dismissed, but this is our the eastern red cedar, or sometimes I like to call the Virginia juniper. Botanically, it's not really a cedar. It is a juniper. Uh, they, they are common throughout. You'll see them growing in all kinds of roadsides, open spaces, any kind of disturbed ground. If somebody has been in, again, if it's agriculture and they've been plowing a field, where it was cleared for development. It's sitting there for the wait's next stage. Some of the first plants will pop up in there is this uh, red cedar. So they come in quickly. Uh, they're wonderful wildlife plants because it produces the juniper berries. It provides excellent shelter for it. Uh, they can be a little bit prickly, so some people don't like that about them. This variety, I don't know the exact one, uh, which this is, but I can tell it's a variety. It was selected here, this out Meadow Art Gardens, where, where they were planted uh, to enhance sort of this blue-green coloration. Because again, when you look at just the red cedar, they can go almost from a russet brownish red to this nice sort of powder blue. So there's a lot of variability in there in terms of color. Since more and more people are trying to include native plantings in our home landscapes, there's more varieties have been developed to give us maybe more consistent coloration. Or there's one that I would love to, I, I was going to bring it in, but they were just too big. There's one that's called Taylor's, which is a very columnar, very vertical, upright form, uh, which a lot of people are finding useful in their landscape because we're frequently challenged to just not having the space. We want the privacy, we want the enclosure. Uh, but we're so crowded that sometimes finding a smaller, denser, tighter, more compact cultivar really fits well into our landscape planning. Uh, the Southern Magnolia, uh, sort of quintessential plant of the South, put in here because it's got this nice evergreen foliage. Again, it will be very, very useful as a specimen plant just because of the sheer beauty of the plant, as well as the gorgeous flowers that come for us, uh, beautiful flowers like this that we can see in summer, but it can also be functional as a native plant, or I mean, as a um, evergreen plant. What I was gonna say is, get myself a little off track. It's actually, it's a native to Southern US, but not necessarily native to, the, to Virginia. So it was introduced into Virginia, has since naturalized itself, but really it came from sort of Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas, Florida, and has made its way up here. But we love it for the beautiful evergreen foliage, the fragrant blooms, uh, nice specimen plant, many varieties to choose from. But there are a few of them that were selected to be smaller and more compact to fit into our smaller, more compact landscapes and gardens. So Alta, this was out at Brookside Gardens, a very columnar one. So this will grow up tall. It can go 20, 30 feet tall easily, but it's very narrow. Uh, so if you might want the height, but not the spread on it. Little Gem, again, very compact in its growth, denser. They will go 25, 30 feet tall, uh, but it stays compact and dense. And still that little gem, that's little compared to the parent plant, which might've gone 50, 60, 70 feet tall and wide. So it's a compact form. And then there's teddy bear, which you can see very small compact form, probably gonna stay under 20 feet tall. So we have these options that are out there. And I think that that couldn't be incorporated into our landscapes uh, to provide this kind of privacy or screening. The cryptomeria, 
This is obviously an Asian plant that's in there. Cryptomeria japonica tells us that. It can be a nice specimen tree like we see here down at uh, Lewis Ginter Botanical Gardens. It's got this kind of just nice soft plumy type of uh, needle that's on there. And let me say a lot of our evergreens like cryptomeria, this camisipris, the pines, spruce, these needles, they, they live for anywhere from about two to three years. And then right now in October, you'll start to see some of them yellow and shed and drop off. But that's only going to be on the interior of the plant. So if you see that happening, it's starting. It's sort of happening right now. Don't be concerned. That's a normal growth pattern on it, as long as it should stay green all the way out to the tips. Close up on the foliage there. But here I thought was a nice grouping. It starts to show where they can actually be grouped together and start to provide a little bit of that screening or enclosure also. So again, these, these are plants that just have a lot of functionality to it. Uh, switching over a little bit to a couple of evergreen shrubs that are out there. The Chindo viburnum, again, this is a, an Asian plant. It's nothing native about it, but it is a evergreen. They can get quite large, as you see in the image here. We are pushing the limits a little bit on its northernmost boundary as far as its cold hardiness. So I do like to put it in a sheltered location. This is true on a lot of our broadleaf evergreens. During the winter time, they're evergreen. They're still transpiring. They're still watering and or losing moisture through their leaves, moving uh, moisture through their roots and through the leaves. So they need water even throughout the winter. So if it's in a very exposed, cold, dry, windy location, then they will get winter burn on it. They get just desiccated and dried out a little bit. So use like this at American University where it's sort of sheltered up against the, the office building, perfect environment, perfect situation. They come through the winter just absolutely fine. There's also, you might have seen earlier, like I said, the leather leaf viburnum, which can be useful. But again, it gets big. It's a plant that you got to have some space for it. Uh, one that you don't see a whole lot of, but I think it has a place, either as more of a low hedge. Uh, this one is probably, this is down Metal Art Gardens, and we're think, topping out at about three foot tall. Uh, this is probably either the spreading prostate one, or there's also one that's called Duke. When you come see us, don't try to remember these names. Just come see us and know they're out there and we'll fill you in the details. But what's nice here, this is a, this plum you, it's deer resistant. I've had good reliability on that. It's also quite shade tolerant. And you're looking at an upright form over here, which if you wanted or needed to create some more height in there, I think it has a lot of utility. The thing that people maybe don't like about it is it is a fairly slow grower. So you're gonna to have to have a little bit of patience. But I was talking with one of our customers today about their garden. I'm just saying, well, this is the deal. You know, you not everybody has a lot of patience, but gardening is gonna teach it to you because some of these things just take time. That's just the way it is. If you don't have the time or patience, then we're talking about buying some bigger plants. Um, we're just having to adjust our expectations on. But a super sturdy, wonderful plant. I'm going to hit two more real quickly here, and then we'll go to our questions. So I hope you are lining up the questions that come in. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit just briefly about bayberry, uh, because a lot of times I think in our, our move towards uh, native plants, which is a fantastic thing, we still need to be realistic in our plant selections, understand what we're doing. And while this is a Virginia native plant, it's evergreen, it's they're just beautiful evergreen shrubs, provide a lot of wildlife value, have all these good things to say about. When you look at where they really are growing, their naturalized areas, you know, we're down here, sort of Norfolk, Virginia Beach area, you know, coastal areas. So what happens is they really thrive down there in moist environments but it's somewhat sandy soil conditions. So I was visiting down Norfolk Botanic Gardens just this summer of, and, oh, took a little side trip from there over to a man-made um, man wetlands. It had, been, it had been built 25 years ago. I wanted to see what that looked like 25 years later. Beautiful, gorgeous um, bayberry out there. But what they're doing is they're growing in a, a, in a wet, boggy environment actually, but sandy soils. I see some of these plants and when we bring them up here and put them in some of the clay soils, they don't, they just don't perform quite as well. This person I think, knew what they were doing 
and bring them up on a mat on a mound, uh, making sure that they have good drainage. So I feel like even some of these plants, just like the inkberry, is uh, hugely popular. Uh, we see a lot of these at the clinic, uh, just because it grows in a wet area um, and it's native to Virginia doesn't necessarily mean this is going to perform just as well for you when you put it in dense clay here in the Piedmont. So I think, again, it's a plant that's being utilized a lot, and it's a beautiful plant. Again, it has a lot of wildlife and ecological value to it, but I'm just putting out there saying I get a lot of these returned uh, at the clinic because people just don't understand it, uh, where it looks beautiful. I was looking at one of these just down at, uh, I think it was, yeah, I think it was Ocean City, and here there is like a row. I'm out there in front of an auto dealership, uh, totally neglected but also totally gorgeous, dense, full, all the way down to the bottom, lustrous, vigorous, um, just doing wonderfully. Uh, again, but I think they're growing in a more of a sandy soil condition uh, where they tend to thrive because just like uh, before, they are natives, but they're down here in sort of that southeastern part of the states. So let me wrap this up real quick. Uh, when you're looking at creating this, we definitely need to think in terms of the time frames because a lot of what we choose for our plant selections, the spacing that we put them on is all going to be driven by the function that they need to serve and the space that we have to work with. I've mentioned a lot of these different varieties that are out there. So if you don't have the space, we can always look for a variety. It might be a little smaller, more compact to fit within you in there. Uh, and I mentioned that because things like the green giant, the Leyland cypress, even some of the arbor varieties, they sometimes left us disappointed because when we planted them at two and three feet tall, cute little plants, then we were pretty disappointed and heartbroken when they're all congested together and 30 feet tall and overwhelming things. So we do also want to make sure that we build this diversity. Uh, don't rely on any one plant. Uh, just not only is it boring and dull, but a more diverse landscape is going to give you more diverse uh, ecological value in terms of wildlife support, habitats, beneficial insects, so many ways, more resilience in your landscape. Uh, we should absolutely uh, work with native plants as much as we can where they serve that purpose. Just keep in mind that they are going to need the same considerations uh, that we do anytime we're selecting plants. And most of all, I say we want diversify, 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 and I'm going to stop talking and see if we have any questions. All right. Yes, we do have a few questions here. Uh, first one, a customer has 20 arborvitae planted as a border around their backyard, which they did this past summer. Um, half are now brown. They brought a sample in um, and it had, it had black fungus and spider mites. And they were given, um, so they gave insect and fungus, fungus spray. Um, okay. Should they keep the trees till spring and reevaluate then, but continue to spread to the to the other trees over winter? Uh, so mites basically will um, they'll shut down. You know, once we get a hard freeze, that's at the end of the end of the day. There, most we do have cool season, and warm season mites, but I'm gonna I don't want to complicate things. You're probably just dealing with what's the, what they call southern red mite or two spotted spider mite. That's a warm season mite. When the freezing temperatures come boom, they're dead. But any eggs that they have, those eggs will persist through the winter. And when things start to warm up, more like May, June time period, those eggs will hatch um, and, and activity may resume. Uh, one thing I'll just toss out there is you may want to consider spraying the arborvitae with a horticultural oil. The oil will will destroy some of those eggs. So that's more of a preventative treatment. So I don't think you need to continue spraying with the um, insect disease and mite control. That's a good product, it's an appropriate thing to do, but their activity slowing down with the cold temperatures, maybe consider spraying with a horticultural oil. We reevaluate in spring. You won't know anything until next spring because the new growth will start to come out around April. What I think is gonna happen is you're gonna see nice, healthy new growth start popping out in April. You'll see them continue to fill in. I really don't think you need to be talking or even thinking about replacement. They're, they're gorgeous plants. And I think you're going to get 
success and recovery with them. Gotcha. And then for the black fungus part of that, was that caught, what was the cause of that overwatering or watering the leaves? Uh, that's something I'd, I'd want to actually see or get a uh, look at. They rarely get disease problems. They can get a little bit of a, a tip blight, but that's not anything that kills plants or that's persistent. Um, maybe associated with wet conditions, but but I don't think that disease thing is going to be persistent or even significant. Gotcha. All right. Next question is, does the leprechaun variety of the green giant arborvitae have anything to offer birds, bees, et cetera? Um, it would provide shelter like any other evergreen does in terms of as a food source. I'm going to say not really. I don't even know if it produces a cone because again, the, um, turn the one cones. It may, I, it, this is such a new plant. I never even saw it until yesterday. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm learning about it like everybody else does. Because uh, the arborvitaes may produce a small cone, but its, it's food value, I'm going to say, is basically minimal. Uh, but it would provide uh, shelter and where you know birds can jump in there sort of for uh, protection and shelter from cold, wet predators, that type of a thing. Wonderful. Next question is, is the Nellie Stevens holly deer resistant and is it susceptible to disease? Oddly enough, um, deer generally leave a lot of hollies alone, but deer like to browse on Nellie Stevens. Uh, they, they don't ever really demolish it. Uh, they don't go after it like they do a daylily or a hosta or anything like that, but they will come and they will browse on it during the winter time. They'll browse the new tips off of it and the spring growth. So if you have a heavy deer population, that can be an issue. Uh, disease problems, nothing really noteworthy. Uh, again, they can get a root rot disease in wet, poorly drained conditions, but that's pretty typical of, of most plants that are out there. The American holly tends to be much more disease resistant but it's also a slower growing one. So you, you kind of have to balance what's what your needs are and what's going to work best for you. Wonderful. Um, next question is a customer or a attendee. Uh, so has a townhouse community uh, that has mostly white pines originally planted by the builder, which di quickly died possibly because of shallow roots. Um, is there another pine or another tree that you would suggest that will survive in common areas which are not regularly watered? Ooh, so let, let me just say that uh, a lot of pines and spruce just are not quite as resilient and not as tolerant of urban conditions, and many of them grow quite large. So I sort of left them out of my slide set. Uh, that doesn't mean there isn't a place for them in the landscape, uh, but just like you've experienced with white pines, when you put them in heavy, dense clay soil, uh, compacted conditions, you know, they're not going to put up with poor drainage. And if they do succeed with them, they get really huge. So uh, tend to stay away from them, though our native Virginia pine, I think, does have a place in the landscape. It hasn't been as popular as many others because it's more irregular uh, in its form and shape, but it might be something you consider looking at and it's coming of kind of more into vogue. Uh, so I would look at that. If we go outside of sort of native stuff, I mean, like the Japanese white pine is really more of a specimen plant than it is uh, than a screening plant, but I think that can be a beautiful one for you. If you want to grow spruce, the Norway spruce is the biggest, most vigorous and robust one, but you got to have some space for it that's in there. Other than that, I'd be looking at things like the, the Virginia juniper, the red cedar that's out there. It's a great screening plant. will grow in almost any kind of conditions that are out there. Um, and it's a nice native one. And if I thought about Anyway, that's all I can think of right now. We could, if you come in here, I'm sure we can come up with some other options for you. Yeah. All right. Continuing on, uh, if arborvitae get too tall for your yard, can you top them or will that kill them? So topping uh, arborvitae doesn't kill it, but it really just detracts from its shape. 
of what happens on a lot of these conifers, all their growth grows out at the tips. So if you cut back, if you need to significantly reduce the size, if I cut back into where the old growth is and there's no vegetation, it doesn't fill back in. It just leaves a bald spot. So if you are topping an arborvitae, you cut the top out of it, it's not going to regrow. Some of the lateral branches will take over and resume, but you've kind of just lost the pyramidal shape on it. So, so if we can avoid that by just selecting a, a smaller, more compact variety, and we have so many choices, I would rather avoid it. If it's already there and you need to reduce the height on it, um, you can do it. It's not going to kill the plant, but it will change its shape and it's going to be permanent. You only get one shot at it. Uh, next question, and we are running out of time, so I think we'll probably make this one or maybe the next one the last one, depending. Um, does skip laurel get the same diseases mentioned for the cherry laurel? Yes, skip is a variety of cherry laurel. And again, this is why I, I keep throwing all this taxonomy around. The genus Prunus, if you think about cherries, plums, peaches, and cherry laurel, they're all close relatives. You don't think of that when you look at a cherry laurel, but when you see the blooms, um, you'll see the similarities that they're all in the rose family and they all get similar complex of insect and diseases. That's not to put down that choice of plant. It's just to say, let's not overdo it. Let's not rely on that as my one and only landscape plant. So again, there's several varieties. Skip is just one variety. It's um, a very nice, dense, dark green one that goes at about six, eight feet. And if you talk to our plant specialists, there's some new varieties. I just can't remember the name. They're showing better uh, disease resistance in the landscape. We're having some good success with. So we, we've got, there's always new stuff and we've got some ways we might be able to address that leaf spot disease. Wonderful. Well, we are at 247 now, so I think we are at our time, David. Um, but I wanted to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, if your questions didn't get answered, we still had a few uh, left over, but uh, if your questions did not get answered, feel free to reach out to us uh, for uh, through our, our website at maryfieldgardencenter.com, the contact us form. Um, we have uh, a bit of a break uh, as we're figuring out David's next um, virtual plant clinic. And then we have uh, a couple other events coming up like our, uh, our holiday night out, uh, which is uh, um, our ladies night out rebranding at, at our, that we're redoing. So we're going to try and figure out how we can do our virtual plant clinics around then. Um, but for everybody else, thank you for coming today. Keep on the lookout uh, for your email. Um, we'll have this uh, uh, webinar today uh, up on our YouTube page. And I believe Sally will will send out a uh, email reminder or an email follow-up that has uh, a link to this uh, video if you want to watch it again. Um, but uh, uh, I think that is about it for today. So uh, thank you all. Uh, David, do you have anything else to end with? No, just uh, like you're talking about all the different events and classes and things we have going on, you know, go best thing I think is go to our website, click on that events and classes buttons because there's a lot of cool stuff coming up for the fall and the holidays. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. That's well said. All right. Thank you, everybody. You have a great uh, uh, rest of your day. Bye-bye.